Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good morning, Team Krulak community, and on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brew Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brewcast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Krulak Center. So uh, we are wrapping up this season of the Brewcast before our summer hiatus, and we can't end on a higher note than we are today with the guests on our program. This is a culmination of the themes we've covered in past episodes over the last year, which have covered the many changes the Marine Corps has been going through under Force Design 2030. Past episodes, we've talked about talent management, marksmanship training, JADC2, training and education, wargaming, service level experimentation in 29 Palms, and real world applications with, with Task Force 61 Task 2 in Europe. And today, we'll get the view of all these changes and more from the top with General David Berger, 38th Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. General Berger has served in the Marine Corps since his commissioning as an infantry officer in 1981 and assumed the duties of the Commandant in July 2019. So General Berger, sir, it's a tremendous honor to have you here on the Brewcast. Uh, it's a special treat to have you here in person in our little informal between two ferns type setup here. Um, and so we welcome you and I'd like to, before we get into questions, just if you have any opening, no, opening thanks thoughts for, or comments. Uh, thanks for having me down here. I look forward to, I want to leave the questions for the for the crews and the time for them. So, ready to go. Great, sir. We'll get right to it. So, uh, kind of talked about two things here. I'd say there are sort of two big things that really um, marked the first year of your time as the Commandant, one of which was expected, which was the Commandant's planning guidance into Force Design 2030 release, and then the other one, which was unexpected for all of us, which was the COVID-19 pandemic around the world. So, I want to start with the expected, and then we'll, we'll get into the, okay. the unexpected. So, um, for Force Design 2030, that's really, it's, it's been sort of the dominant trajectory of your time as Commandant. It was teased out in the planning guidance that was released in 2019, uh, which we all, I think, safe to say we went through with a fine tooth comb to see, all right, this is what's coming, this is what we need to be ready for. And then in the early 2020 is when the formal uh, Force Design 2030 document came out. It laid out a very um, cross-institutional and aggressive plan for changing um, or updating many aspects of the force. And uh, it's been executed since then. Um, although there, you know, there are certainly some things which are now gonna fall into General Smith's tenure when he takes over. So, so with that, with the aggressive pace, um, I, I'm assuming there are probably some things that uh, you, you would have liked to get done faster in the time that you were, uh, you were sitting in your chair. So for Force Design 2030, where are some of the things that you wish could have gone a little bit more quickly? The relative pace that uh, you mentioned, Ian, for me are the pacing threat and the pace of technological change. Those are the two drivers. In terms of how fast do we need to move in order to stay ahead, those are the two main drivers. What things do I wish could have gone faster? Um, intentionally, in the, in the, in the force design cons construct, we began with the thread-informed, concept-driven approach, which is what combat development's all about. And the long lead time, in other words, the things that take the longest are equipment. So we had to focus our decisions early on on the equipment part of it, not because they were more important, just because they take longer to either get rid of things or bring things in and get them moving. So had to start with that early on. So that meant a later start for really the most important part, which was not equipment. The most important part is the people. Mm -hmm. So what, no, we're not a real regret, but I think I understood that the, the equipment part was gonna take long lead time to get moving. If I could have found a way to focus on the people from day one more, um, not a regret, but I'd have liked to have done that because that, that is at the epicenter of force design, is the human being, the, the Marine. Right. Other than that, there are external things that we can't make go any faster that I would have liked to seen go faster, still would. The tactical and operational mobility that 
things like LSMs provide. Um, like to see that go faster. Organic precision munitions, loitering munitions, like to see those things go faster. I'd like to see us change um, the talent management uh, initiatives that we have, that the organization has laid out, like they, I'd like to see them go faster. We lost some time on things like information technology to support that, the IT systems, in other words, and that, that exist in MNRA and other places. We needed to put the resources into that to make change happen. So I think overall, I'm happy with where things are, but would like to see it go faster for sure. Yes, sir. So I, about concurrently with the the formal plan, uh, like mm -hmm. I said, we had the COVID-19 pandemic, which, yeah. you know, really nobody can, can't really plan for a global pandemic and how to respond. Um, and, and like the, you know, like schools, like other institutions, individuals around the globe, the Marine Corps had to, had to adapt and do something to protect its people, um, you know, the most important asset in this, in this completely unexpected yeah. black swan event. And so we, we did a lot of adaptations and changes to do that. and when we could sort of relax those, we went back to it. Uh, but what were some of the challenges or, or, or leadership issues you had to deal with in the midst of the pandemic as well? What were some of the adaptations that the Marine Corps made to deal with it that uh, you, you think would be good to continue moving forward even though we've moved out of it? Um, for me and Sergeant Major Black, probably the two broadest categories were the operational forces, in other words, the Fleet Marine Forces and their need to prepare still to deploy, get on board ship, or fly to wherever their deployment was taking them. So finding a way, unit commanders had to find a way to complete their training and then prepare themselves for deployment, get on ship in very different, in a very different you know, framework. Um, in other words, abide by the Navy's regulations that, that they put in place to control the spread of COVID. So that was radically different. Uh, than, than a normal workup for a deployment. So that was one aspect. Um, the other aspect was on the recruit and recruit training and officer training that had to keep going, in our opinion. Because the, the easiest thing to do would have been to say, uh, we're going to take a time out. We're going to not recruit or not uh, conduct recruit training or officer candidate school for a period of time till we sorted through it. But we both had so much confidence in the leaders on both recruit depots and at officer candidate school that we listened to their plans and they insisted, don't, we, we can keep going. Here's the measures that are prudent that we think we, if we put in place, we'll be able to control it. And we had so much confidence in them, we said, okay, we will. And that's not the, that's not the same as for all the services. Some of the other services took different routes, but because we had such fantastic staff and CEOs and officers leading both recruiting and recruit training, never stopped, made significant adjustments, everything's from the chow hall to the barracks to PT. Um, and recruiting had to fundamentally change because you pointed out schools were, schools were closed. Close so the recruiters were not going to the school cafeteria or the football game or anything like that anymore. They transitioned largely to a virtual construct and here again, I think the creative minds of Marines solved that problem when it was pretty clear there weren't going to be, you know, answers coming from the top as fast as they needed them. So they solved the problems at their level. And long and short, all that, Ian, is I think uh, I, I'm biased because you and me are Marines, but we are taught from the time we come in to deal with fog and friction. That's part of what we do. Mm -hmm. I think COVID for, for Marines was, okay, it's, it's an operating environment. We can adjust to it. It was not a, a hit, hit the panic button uh, or take a knee. It was neither of those. It's just the operating environment's changed. We have a pandemic. We're going to operate through this. But it's just the way we train for combat. Like, we adapt. We, that's, how we do, that's how we do business. Great. Thank you, sir. And I know our, our acting uh, director right now, Lieutenant Colonel Zapata, got a front row seat to the the recruit training adaptation because yeah. he went down to Lejeune uh, for several months. Yeah, where we had to billet Marines separate uh, off campus for a while. Yes, sir. I was I was part of the emergency response that helped plan the Citadel yeah. and the follow-on over in the 
hotels and having a good time. Um, but that was interesting. Just like you said, we, we just adapt and, and uh, accomplish the mission. So it's, it's this great is to be a, on the ground for that. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, it'd be an, you had a front row seat to it, like you're saying, but. There's, a, there's some other kind of, he's hinting at it, there's a couple other kind of Marine Corps sort of under the radar stories that I'll never forget. We needed a place to house Marines who were going to recruit training, who were waiting to go into recruit training to make sure that they were COVID free. So somebody, I don't remember who, suggested the Citadel because the former Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps is now the President of the Citadel. So I called him said, hey, we're, we're, in a, we're in a bind here. We're trying to find a solution. And he goes, well, I'll call you back. So he calls me back two or three days later, and he goes, I think we can free up some dormitories for you because it was timing for the Citadel. They, didn't have, they weren't packed with students. So all this is like Marine to Marine coordination, retired, active duty, didn't matter. He was helping us solve a problem where if we hadn't have done that, we'd have gone out and rented hotels and stuff. But because Marine, hey, I can, I can help you solve that problem. But it was a lot of planning, you're right. Yes, sir. We, I mean, we just took it. I was, I was the, the lead planner for that, and, yeah. and it was just typical deployment. So it's yeah. it seven days a week, and then, you know, General Flynn at the time, after we yep. got through the hump, said, okay, you don't have to work seven days a week. <laughs> it, was, it was funny. I mean, there was nothing else to do, anyways. So right. it was either be in your hotel room or, or be working. This is partly a pride thing, though, and then we can go on to the rest of the questions. We were not going to stop recruiting right. and not going to stop recruit training. They were determined, we will find a way. We will find, and that gave me the confidence to tell the Secretary of Defense, we're not, the Marine Corps is not stopping. Yeah. And he asked me, like, well, what are you going to do? I'm like, I have no idea, but, <laughs> but there are Marines who, who know exactly how to do this. Great, thank you, sir. All right, and since we're sort of turning out to the, the in-person audience here now, yeah. I'll open it up. Does anyone have a, a question from in the room here? Well, I'll start, uh, sir. Looking at force design, uh, it, it was, at least from, from my perspective, in a very general way, it's meant to address the operational requirements of the future battlefield. And as you mentioned in, in some of your remarks, there's continuous change to technology and the pacing threat. As you look down the road, what are the most critical areas uh, that you see will manifest themselves on the battlefield? And what do we need to do as, as a Marine Corps to, to stay ahead of that ever evolving uh, technology or, or whatever it is? Um, before the technology is the people, as, as we talked about before. So we, can, we have to focus on that. We have to modernize the way that we manage all the information and data we have on Marines and how to recruit them and develop their career paths and all that, kind of, all that goes along with that. We have to put the money, the resources into modernizing that. Because we've had good systems, but they're, they've seen some years and we've got we to gotta put the resources into that. Beyond that, you know, what, what areas do I think are changing quickly that we'll need to make sure we're in front of? Certainly artificial intelligence, no question. Um, in all of its applications, from operations and tactics to logistics. Autonomous, autonomy uh, and unmanned systems, another area, we have to lead the way. We're smaller as a Marine Corps, we should be more agile, able to try things out and see what works and what doesn't work. But the growth, the expansion of unmanned systems overlaid with autonomy on top of it, we should be at the front edge of that. Why? Because we are the forwardmost force. It makes sense for us to employ those and learn how to employ those things. Um, I think also the learning that has occurred over the last three or four years about not just lethality, which is no less important today than it always has been. But how do we collect against the adversary and how do we try to prevent them from collecting against us if you're that forward stand-in force? How do you do that in, in the future battlefield? 
because uh, some of it is conventional reconnaissance, which some of us grew up in, in, in the ground side or aviation side, but some of it now is much more in the electromagnetic spectrum space. So th these, are, these are places that, that we didn't need to pay attention to 20 years ago. We will absolutely have to master going forward. If we're going to collect against, if we're going to be response, if we're going to do the reconnaissance, counter reconnaissance in the way I think it has to be done and win that, you have to understand all those domains. You got to be comfortable operating in all those domains. So I think f for us, there's parts that stay the same. The what it is to become a Marine, the physical part, the aggressive part, the I see an initiative, I'm moving. I don't need detailed guidance, direction from above. I'm moving. I have their intent. I can act. But there are also aspects of weaving together these different capabilities in different domains that didn't, weren't players before, weren't important before. Now they will be, absolutely. But the good part is, I think, you know, unlike me, the lieutenants and um, graduates coming out of Paris Island and San Diego, they have grown up in that world with a cell phone in their hand since they were seven years old. They'll, they had know how to master this. They're co very comfortable with that. We'll be fine. We'll be in good shape. Last part I would mention, I think, is training, frankly. The way that you and I grew up in that training environment and those training tools has to change for a lot of reasons. But much more modeling and simulation, more war gaming, um, more ways to get repetitions for a uh, leader, not in, in the sort of ender's game way where it's not 10 or 15, but 100 repetitions. To give them, I've seen this pattern over and over again. They, they are able to make decisions faster. So I think the way that we train, more virtual, more constructive, uh, and in a way that gives uh, leaders the chance to make tactical decisions over and over and over and over again. 100, 500 times. Great, thank you, sir. And that's, I'm gonna have a couple more things here on the live virtual constructive here okay. in just a moment. But I do want to, uh, some of the questions from the audience, they jump into the, the use of those UAS systems as well uh, as how they're incorporated into training. So I'm gonna kind of bucket some of these together. So with, um, obviously, there's a huge increased prevalence of the small UAS especially, but other sizes on the battlefield. We've been right. watching it in Ukraine on a daily basis. Um, and the Marine Corps is taking steps to, to start including those more in both its units and its training. But um, what do you see the future of uncrewed aviation in the Marine Corps writ large? And then how, how does the Marine Corps need to tackle some of those training challenges where the, the questioner notes that we need to use the small UAS, but training range requirements can be very, uh, very constraining in terms of how we do it. So how do, how do we get, what does that future force look like and what do we need to do to training so that we're, we're training in a realistic fashion with those devices? I think there are some, peop some folks are talking now for the past year about just the basics of the six functions of aviation and how does unmanned weave in, are there six going forward or more than six? Or do they change in other words? We ha we, you and I grew up in a world where UASs were first things that collected, had mm -hmm. cameras on them, and then after that had weapon systems on them. Where we, have to, where we have to focus now is to expand into is logistics. Um, how can unmanned systems enable us to do logistics in a contested environment across distances? How can we move supplies? How can we move parts? How can we mu move uh, munitions, fuel? How do we do that using unmanned systems to generate, in order to generate tempo? So I think not that the uh, unmanned collection and the unmanned weapon systems uh, that are airborne go away. I don't think so. They don't go away. But now we have to, f we have to solve things like the logistical challenge in a contested environment, in a maritime contested environment, in a littoral contested environment. How do we do that with unmanned systems? How do you manage that airspace? Uh, or not? Above what altitudes? Do the rules for group one through five still apply? Mm -hmm. That's kind of the hint of two or three. Is it a group two or a group three? Um, the lines are being blurred right now because it's not so simple to say size and weight equals a group. Now capabilities that were in group five are in group three. Right. 
the, the, the old frameworks may not have, may, may have outlived themselves. Time to relook that. I think there, we were having a discussion in the last few days about uh, is, it, is it a primary MOS? Is robotics and autonomous systems its own MOS, or is it something that everybody does as part of your primary MOS? Great question to tackle. Um, and I don't, we don't know the answers to those questions yet. But I think the ratio of manned and unmanned systems clearly changes over the next decade. I don't know where it ends up, but I, it's definitely not what it is today. And that backs itself into the, that has to have an impact then on training and education and MOSs and everything else. How many unmanned naval aviators compared to manned mm -hmm. naval aviators do we need a decade from now? Because if we can see some change, then we need, to, we need to gear up the training and education framework to prepare for that. All right. You've got to think in advance. And that's not just a question for naval aviators. No, I, absolutely not. The Air Force is probably going to have to do some, some real grappling with this. How about on the ground side? We have motor transport operators and we have mechanics. Who's going to operate all the unmanned vehicles we have? Is it a grunt? In other words, is it an O3XX or is it a motor trans is it a motor T MOS thing? What is it? What about the craft? What about the vessels that we'll have? Some of which will be manned, some will be unmanned. How do we how do we fit that into how do we stitch that into the Marine Air Ground Task Force? All questions we will have to tackle. They are the uh, I, I know uh, in the most recent um, document that came out there was the term martial robotics that caught my attention mm -hmm. and I thought uh, one, I, I like the phrasing of that because um, it really it puts it in the military context. But I also thought, you know, Marine Corps being the first forward thinking to establish kind of our own laws of robotics, yeah. you know, for how we're going to, how at least we think we're going to be using these systems. Yeah, I think so I've heard the phrase intelligent robotics and autonomous systems, IRAS, as another sort of a framework for how to think of this. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out because there are really bright people working on it. But my, my sense is, as the forward force, as the nation's stand-in crisis response force, we should, be able, we should be on the leading edge of all that, not the back edge, the front edge. Right. Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to shift back to the, to the live virtual constructive point that you made just now, sir, and, uh, and kind of put it in the context of the larger war gaming efforts that have been going on around the Marine Corps. Yeah. In the, I remember when the Commandant's planning guidance came out. You know, in, inside the room here, we, we, we did a little bit of wargaming, but we went through and we, were, we yeah. underlined and highlighted the heck out of the wargaming part because it was pretty clear that the different flavors of wargaming were very important and were going to yep. be a huge way that we were going to start thinking through and experimenting with some of these problems. So, um, you know, so there's the, the work we've done here, there's the work that's going on over at the, uh, the wargaming center as it gets ready to open, and then and that doesn't even get into how we can use some of these systems to do live virtual constructive training, right. um, you know, augmented reality type training where you're mixing computers and and trons with the real environment. Um, with, with with what's been accomplished so far in the last four years in those realms, where do you see this trajectory? Where do you want it to go in the next four yeah. years? Well, I think terminology. You all you all are uh, better qualified to state what I'm about to state than I am, but. We got to make sure we use accurate terminology. If it's a training event, then we're training human beings to increase their proficiency. If it's a war game, then we're trying to test out a concept, test out something to see how practical it is, how well it will work. And some some kind of some kind of events allow you to do a little some of both. But I'm careful not to meld the two together. Either the primary focus is training and that's a marine we, and a unit we need to get to a higher level of proficiency or the primary goal is wargaming in which we want to try out different concepts and see what might work in, better than others. Where do I see it, you know, what's, where are we four years into this? I think the wargaming center itself is a manifestation of we're right on the edge of mm -hmm. being able to at all levels of classification and all services and international partners and interagency do what is very difficult to do in one physical place, bring all that together. 
uh, and allow uh, either for wargaming where you're trying different things or actually an exercise like a tabletop highly classified exercise where real decision makers are making real decisions and understand, learning the consequences of those. There's not very many venues for that to happen. Right. But we're about to have a physical location mm -hmm. where that's possible. And it can be, and it's connected virtually, of course, to other wargaming centers. So, God, if, I mean, General Neller had this vision and it's coming to fruition now in, a, in, in the next year. Um, I think probably everything that he had in mind, it'll, uh, it'll be that and more. Wargaming as a, as a thing, though, I think more people are excited about it, more people are clearly involved in it, which I see as a good thing. We have to learn quickly. We have to try. Uh, we have, some people call it fail fast, but you're only failing in order to learn, not just failing for failing's sake. So I think wargaming that's, that's embraced here is hugely helpful to us because it allows you to, um, I don't know the right way to capture it, but for the period of the war game, if you're disciplined enough, you can put your biases, your backgrounds aside to a bit and say, try this approach. Uh, and there are no consequences. No Marines are wasting their time in the field. No one's getting hurt. You can, you can test out things. I think the learning and how to war game is happening now. It's really healthy for us. It's good. Yes, I mean, some of the events that we've done here, um, either at the center or for the schools, is watching some of the students take that yeah. risk and do things like, wow, you know, I never would have done that, but, uh, you know, you got to try it and, um, and see whether or not it worked in that context. And, and seeing that learning happen is really um, tremendously valuable. I think so. Yeah, I mean, it augments training to some degree through one lens. But here, yeah, it allows them to try things. Right. It does. All right, thank you, sir. Okay, I'm yeah. going to go back to the room here, uh, to the audience. Anyone have a question? Jeff, we're, we're allowed to change change the areas of the questions. Sure. Okay. Yes. Um, so, Commandant, sir, as you're you know ending over 40 years of service, um, for for those individuals that are the that are at the forefront, so the company battalion commanders that are executing the vision of Force 9 2030, you know, looking back on decades of experience, three three main things that you you might recommend to them as they you know as they're at the front. Front edge of this change within the service, sir. I'm not sure you have any thoughts here. Um, I think the constants are you had to be 40 years ago, 30 years ago, you had to be, you were expected to be very, very good in your MOS, very, very good in, and at your, whatever your unit was, that tactical competence trumped everything. Being ready to deploy, being ready to, to fight and win using the Sergeant Major's terminology, that doesn't change. That has to be front and center all the time. Because everything else doesn't count if you lose, if, you, if your Marines get killed because you were not ready, not prepared. So having yourselves, myself, and your unit prepared always is number one. But now we're adding the second part that you're talking about, which is in order to stay in front of a moving adversary, we're also asking you not just to be good, at your specialty and your unit be highly trained, very ready. We're also asking you to be the, labor the laboratory for the Marine Corps. That's an extra task. So now, I, but I am, I am very confident that battalion commanders, squadron commanders, all the, all the commanders that we have are balancing the time that they have available to train, one, to master where they need to be in terms of readiness, but also dedicate time to learn for the Marine Corps so that we can stay in front of the threat. Because we don't have, we can't afford, and I actually think it's not the right call right now to have an experimental set-aside unit. We've done that in the past, and it was done for the right reasons, but that was a different environment. Oh. What do you have to do? Know your, know your job. <laughs> you know your people, know your unit. Focus on being ready all the time. But also understand how to balance that against now the need to learn quickly. Third part, I would say would, what you highlighted. We should grow up being comfortable challenging the status quo. That's not disloyal. It means constantly thinking, I wonder if there's a better way. And allowing your Marines to do the same. 
allowing our Marines to do the same. And if it doesn't work out the way they want to try it and it doesn't work any better, first thing we should do is say, great job. Because they had the courage to try it a different way. Because if we're all super conservative, I don't want to take any risks, I'm not going to rock the boat, I need to stay between the lines, you know what, we're going to fall behind. So I think Marine leaders who lead in a way that allows, enables other Marines to try things, to experiment, to try a different way, to question, why do we do it that way? I think that's the healthiest Marine Corps we can have. That's not disloyal, that's not disobedient. That's actually learning. That will keep us in front. Great. Uh, thank you, sir, and thank you, Kevin Herbold. So, actually to that point of, of challenging the status quo, a lot of elements of what's been done under force design and its subordinate components have really challenged how the Marine Corps has been organized, equipped, uh, trained in a lot of different ways, and it's, it's generated some criticism from outside in terms of the hows and the whys that this has gone around. Um, did, did this critique surprise you? And what, what were, if it did, um, what was surprising about the, the pushback on some of these changes? It surprised me. Uh, anytime, you know, in any organization, in the military or otherwise, if you're going to make change, if you feel like your organization has to change, you're never, you're not going to have consensus, and not everybody's going to be on board. The safest thing, in other words, is no change. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also the the most risky long term that you fall behind the competition. We can't allow for that to happen. What surprised me? the lack of trust. Here's what I mean by that. Um, across all of headquarters Marine Corps, including the deputy commandants that are here at Quantico uh, for manpower and reserve affairs, for, for combat development and integration, um, MARCOR SISCOM training and education command, the war fighting lab, all of the headquarters Marine Corps people who are involved in force design, who are, who are sifting through everything that we're learning and finding what makes sense to adopt and not. And all of the units across the Marine Corps that are experimenting, that, we're, that is our laboratory. That's how we're going to test out concepts and test out equipment. The lack of trust in all of that from the top-down guidance to the bottom-up refinement, the, the squad, the section of aircraft, all the way through the colonels who were sifting through that to the generals who were doing the same, all of that driving force design. To not have trust in that, that surprises me. That really surprised me because I have incredible amount of trust in all that. None of this, you, I mean, it, it's common sense. None of this is fabricated by one or two people. It is driven by a gigantic machine of very experienced, very smart people. So I think what surprises me, the lack of trust. I have an incredible amount of trust in that process and all those people. The lack of trust surprised me. Yeah. All right. Thank you, sir. I'm going to shift back to the virtual audience yeah. here. And um, this, this is going to go into talking about active versus reserve component. Um, mm. So. Uh, Part of the, you know, the changes going forward is we're looking at ways to open more pathways for Marines to transition from active to reserve and vice versa. Um, I, I forget the term, but there's, there's a, you yeah. know, a, it, it's a more permeability. Yes, yeah, that was yeah. a permeability between those two. And um, it's, it's still a work in progress um, it is. To, to get it, I think, to the sort of the throughput that you desire. So uh, the question is, are there, are there statutory obstacles to this that have to be Work to, or work through to increase that permeability? Is it something within the Marine Corps that, or DOD that we, could, we have a little more control over? And um, what pathway do you see to help um, open that bandwidth and increase that permeability? Some of it is uh, policy and regulations, but that, doesn't, that should not stop us. That's not an excuse and we can move faster, even with existing policies and regulations directed. We could still move faster. But we do have to tackle that part of it. Some of it is the, as simple, I know it sounds simple, some of it is as simple as the information systems that we have. Mm -hmm. Where now, to do, uh, to apply 
for that kind of a transfer from active duty to reserve, reserved active duty is, 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 a, is about as onerous as it is to re-enlist or more so. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you've done this, right? How many, how many copies of a re-enlistment document, how many pages is that? How many signatures is all that? Okay, we need to reduce that to the same way that you ap apply for and get approved for a mortgage, right. which means on your phone. So when, you, when you're active duty or reserve and you can apply to move back and forth on your phone, we'll be making progress. When it's not 25 signatures and 14 pages, it's digital. So some of it is the information systems, the technology. Um, and some of it is a cultural change, too, that we have to embrace in the Marine Corps. That leaving active duty doesn't mean you're leaving the Marine Corps. It means which reserve unit are you going to join? Mm -hmm. And the, and the reserves, uh, while they're trying to support their own end strength, they have to support you who want to go on active duty. Not, not, and they're not, but not obstruct that or make it difficult. We've got to make it easier to move back and forth. That's the way you characterize it. So some regulatory policy uh, things have to change. Some of it is simple as the going from paper copies to digital. Um, and some of it is cultural, I think, making it actually we're there to we're part of the Marine Corps is there to support the Marine in their choices and make it easier when they want to move back and forth. We need to embrace that. All right, thank you, sir. And I think the uh, the technology piece, hopefully, at least, is maybe the simplest part. And uh, we had the talent management strategy group here mm. a couple weeks ago, and they were talking about a a portal essentially on your phone or your yeah. personal device that would allow you to to do some of those things in, in the way you do all of your other business. Yeah, as you we're said. catching up. We have to catch up. No question. Great. Thank you, sir. Uh, all right. Take another question here from the virtual audience. Sure. And this is going to go into uh, some recent discussions highlighting uh, the, uh, the, the, the shipbuilding challenges that are being faced now yeah. by Marine Corps and Navy um, together. Uh, you mentioned that you, you talked about the Marine Corps Expeditionary Unit remaining the crown jewel of the Corps. Um, but obviously, with there has been some pretty public testimony um, and questions by Congress asking, you know, the uh, the ships that to keep that crown jewel afloat, yeah. there's a delta. So, um, so with that, as we move forward, and if, if we're not expecting any any significant increases or changes in budgetary um, outputs, what what are your thoughts on leveraging non-standard platforms to deploy some portions of the MU or the MAGTAP um, or uh, digging deeper into looking at optimizing other assets afloat mm -hmm. to, to help with that delta while the formal programs yeah. try and fill it. The second part, uh, non-standard platforms already happening. Every, there are seven MUs in the Marine Corps, uh, have been for a long time. There will be as far out as I can see. And every MU commander is using um, everything from EPFs to the uh, Canley and augmenting their three ship amphibious ready group, augmenting it with other platforms throughout the whole float. That's already happening. Not pushed, not directed, just they sense that there's a way to incorporate this into my six month deployment and they're so bright. They have such great uh, planners on their staffs, they're already doing that. I think more of that's going to happen for sure. In terms of the platforms themselves, the ships themselves, I think the, f the step last year by Congress to shift the authority to determine what it, how many amphibious ships does the nation need from the Navy to the Marine Corps, huge mm -hmm. step. Um, so now, not the Navy, but the Marine Corps, the Commandant of the Marine Corps determines what the requirements are for the nation. That's a huge step. But there's two steps to it. One is authorities and one is the resources. So as you point out, the discussions every year come down to the Secretary of the Navy and the, uh, and the administration's priorities and where do different types of ships fit into all of that. But I think the, the shift last year in authorities is a huge one. I think Congress understands you know, long term the fluctuations that happen and try to look mm -hmm. deeper than that and flatten all that out. And that's why they have supported the Marine Corps each year 
even when one administration or another hasn't funded an amphibious ship or two, whatever we needed, Congress has. All right. So what we're talking about, Congress, sir, yeah. um, I know a lot of the uh, sort of the, the planning and the going in position for the, the changes that you've been undertaking has been, we're not asking for more money. We're going to do it with what we have. Um, however, if down the road at some point Congress turned around and said, all right, we're going to, we're going to apply X amount of dollars to the Marine Corps to go do what you think your, your main priority is, w what is the first thing that you would apply that money to? That is the approach. That has been the approach. But we are at the point you are highlighting right now, meaning we've done everything we can within our budget. So moving faster now requires extra help from Congress. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, where there's a prioritized list that we have to provide Congress every year, all the services do, our unfunded priority list. That is the list of, if you want us to move faster in force design, if you support this idea, this is how you, in this order is what we would ask that you resource. And at the top of that list is an amphibious ship because it's not in the budget. After that are the, the things we talked about before. Either there are existing platforms that we would buy more of, F-35s, 53Ks, ACVs. Uh, there are things that have to do with command and control, some of which are unclassified and some of which are classified. And a, whole, mo the, a bulk of them are about the human being. Everything from where they live in the barracks and the military construction that's required there, to training and education, to recruiting, to information systems that they, came, they talked to you about a couple weeks ago. The human part, the marine part, is the biggest chunk. That's where we have to invest consistently. All right, thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, I'll turn it back to the audience in the room here. Does anyone else have a question? No? Okay, sorry, go ahead. Sir, so you've spoken a lot of, during this discussion about autonomous systems and drones and how we're going to incorporate those into the future fight, uh, including into logistics. The uh, big buzz on the civilian side right now is more so about AI and large language models like ChatGPT. How do you see those moving forward, uh, changing force design and the Marine Corps at large? There's a healthy debate, like you point out, on large language models right now. And where does it best, how does it best support the military part? I don't think we know the answer to that yet. It's definitely not writing term papers, but how does it actually help a tactical leader in the field? Or how does it help in the Title X role that not just saves time, but shifts the burden of what somebody would type out or, or, or translate into, into um, a more usable um, and a faster um, movement of information? We don't know yet. Um, but even in the, in the past couple of weeks, a fair amount of discussion on where large language models end up in the military in terms of a capability. I, w I wish I knew the answer. I don't yet. Um, it's an enabler, a supporting tool. But we don't n yet know what, where it's optimally used. You have an, uh, what do you think? Uh, sir, uh, just based on my limited experience with yeah. them, I think they're terrific at uh, kind of taking uh, jobs that required a lot of writing, like you said, um, mm. staff jobs, things like what I do as staff secretary, um, yep. and really decreasing the workload on those individuals, possibly to the point of even personal cutbacks, um, and taking those individuals and putting them towards uh, those missions uh, in, in jobs that require an actual boot on the ground. Some people in the past couple months in the, along those same lines have talked about the, the things that you have to update that take a long time. Uh, everything from uh, curriculums for our programs of instruction to reference publications to doctrine. That it takes a long, 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 long time to go through the drafting and editing and all. Is there a way that large language models can help us, to your point, speed that shorten that so that a human being's involved, but only for the part you need a human being for. The rest, um, is there a way that large language models can help produce them at a faster rate? Because right now it takes two, doctrine writing is too slow. 
with the amount of people you put against it. So how could we speed it up? I don't. That's a. It, it could be just kind of your like the mundane produce documents that don't really require human thinking, but we do it right now by human. Hmm. Interesting. Well, you're in the right. You're in the right billet to see it, I suppose. If in the staff secretary, you see everything that comes in, right, and everything goes out. Hmm. Interesting. Just a, a, as a as a caveat to that, sir, um, when we start looking at the future battlefield with the different, whether it's manned or unmanned capabilities, and different capabilities within the EMS, uh, do you see that we have? the proper authorities and policies and regulations in place to enable those individuals or commanders on the ground at the forward edge to, to do what is needed? Or do you visualize that we will have to adapt and modify those going into the future? We will have to, I think it's B. I think we will have, have to adapt and modify those as we go. Um, the frameworks, let's take airspace for example, the frameworks that are in place right now for how to manage airspace are built around manned platforms. That's why it's so difficult for a UAV operator to fly a UAV from Yuma to China Lake or wherever, because right? the whole airspace is designed for manned platforms, not designed for unmanned things. So we're going to have to adjust the authorities in training and in combat to account for a different ratio of manned and unmanned things. Um, pick the logistics field, for example, and uh, unmanned aerial platforms for logistics. There's a couple companies now that are working on, and already have, um, uh, a capability that uses wing over ground effects. In other words, it's the, using that pocket of air that the wings create at speed to create lift. Only instead of on land, they're on the water. So it allows you to go to C state four, C state five at very low altitudes, haul people or things from point A to point B. Who manages that? Is that part of the airspace? If you, uh, the more unmanned rotary wing platforms that we use, are they part of the wing or are they part of the ground side? And who manages that airspace where they're flying? It's gonna get pretty crowded in the air. How do we, and we're going to have to evolve who has what authorities to make what decisions. It was hard enough the more crowded it got with man things. Imagine 10, 15, 50 times that many platforms flying in the same airspace, same time. How are we going to do that? Interesting challenge, but I think we're going to grow into it. I think it's B. The evolve, the, we, we modify as we go, as we learn. Great, thank you, sir. So I'm looking at the clock. I think uh, we'll have time for a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up here. And going back to the virtual audience, there are a couple questions, and this yeah. is sort of more looking back on your mm. the last four years overall. And the first one is um, uh, noting when when you came in, and uh, I, I forget the time frame, I think it was 2020, but you would, you'd ban the Confederate flag from Marine Corps installations. And your predecessor, General Neller, came out and said not only he applauded it, but he wished he had done that when he was commandant. Um, is there anything in, in, in your time that you wanted to sort of get moving and uh, that would sort of a policy that impacts the daily lives of the Marines, mm. but didn't get off the ground, um, but you're hoping that General Smith, Smith is able to take to completion? Um, first of all, I give uh, full credit to General Neller for the last four years. Here's why. Um, for the last four years, the, the Chief of Naval Operations, the CNO, his number one priority, readiness, rebuild readiness in the Navy. Before me, General Neller's number one priority, rebuild readiness in the Marine Corps. And I say that, I give him credit because we would not be on the path at the speed we're at right now if he hadn't kept readiness the number one thing for four years and rebuilt the Marine Corps' readiness. So for four years, he did the hard work of setting us up so that we could modernize. Otherwise, we wouldn't be where we are. So he, he commented on the Confederate flag, but he deserves so much credit for setting the table, setting the Marine Corps up for moving at speed to modernize and stay in front because he did the hard thing, which was 
rebuild readiness, and then he recognized, because the, the National Defense Strategy came out when he was still Commandant, mm -hmm. and he, he said in, t in his testimony that the Marine Corps wasn't organized, trained, and equipped for what that strategy called us to do in the future. And he was real clear, we're ready now, but we, won't, we were not organized, trained, and equipped for what it called us to do in the future. He set the table for us um, to move in the last four years. I wish I could have made more progress in the information systems for manpower management, talent management. Frustrating uh, for me that I couldn't move faster. Frustrated that I couldn't get the, the, the right tools in the hands of recruiters. They have an antiquated, older system right now uh, that provides them a database and a tool, but it's old and creaky and slow and I was unable to get them in their hands what they really, really need to, to be agile recruiters. I'm frustrated that I couldn't get um, the connectors, the LSMs in the hands of Marines faster than I can get them right now. Uh, too long to settle on the requirement, too long to get the capabilities initially out to the field. Oh, the great part though is because General Smith was at combat development and integration, and then he was the assistant commandant, nobody has a better front row mm -hmm. seat. Nobody knows the ends, every aspect of every issue better than him. So I had a huge advantage coming from Quantico. I could, I could see what General Neller was doing and see how to press down on the gas. General Smith, if he's confirmed, he's got the best seat in the house to know what parts to go faster on, which parts you can wait on. So then looking at that, sir, with you know, General Smith basically going through the, the mm -hmm. corridor to, to fully appreciate what he's going to have to undertake here, um, what, what are, are there, are there any thoughts or advice um, you would share with him as you, when you do the turnover for what he can expect? Nothing he doesn't already know. He's, so uh, he has both the intellect but the common sense like uh, that, that you really want in the best leaders that you and I have worked for. They're very, very smart, but they're also very, very practical and common sense. He's both. He, he I think, he, I don't, I, I will never speak for him because I'm not even capable of that. But he has always, as long as I have known him, kept the Marine in the center of the 10, ten ring. Uh, so I think I don't. He doesn't need that advice from me, but I will be amazed if if he drifts off of that. The Marine is the center. The Marines in the ten ring have to get that right. Everything else is secondary to that. His relationships with Congress, his relationships with civilian leaders, all solid. He he doesn't need anything from me other than support, which I will absolutely give him. I will have trust in him, because you know what I learned. Probably the same thing every other previous commandant's learned. Every day, uh, you get up in the morning, you PT, you read, you read the classified networks, you spend all day discussing things with other leaders, with marine leaders, you travel around to marine units, you speak with industry, you travel to industry. You, you get the benefit of all that when you're the commandant to help you make good decisions. And the day after I retire, all that goes away. I can read, and I may have a security clearance, but my currency drops off about as fast as it did when I redeployed from Iraq or Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, I'm, at, I'm, I'm degree of separation removed. So I will absolutely trust that the sitting commandant has the benefit of everything that I've had for four years every day. Uh, and the decisions he's made, they're informed by it all the stuff we talked about before. And General Smith knows all of that. He knows all that. There's no secrets I could pass on to him. All right, thank you, sir. Um, one last question then, we'll, yeah. we'll wrap up. That turnover time is coming, mm. um, I think early July is when you'll, right. be, you'll be handing over with his, you know, assuming his confirmation goes on track. So what comes next for you, sir, after you take the, the uniform Well, off? first of all, either way I hand over to him, because by law, um, by statute, service chiefs serve four years. Not four years in one day, but four years. 
So I'll hand off, if he's confirmed as the commandant, that's best case. If he's not, I'll hand off to him as the acting commandant. So either way, there'll be a handoff, because by law, um, service chiefs serve four years. After that, um, I'll spend some time with family uh, that you and I have not put on the back burner, but we haven't spent all the time we wanted with family because we had other uh, priorities. Now family comes first uh, in terms of my time, so visit with our kids, spend time with my wife, um, think, read. Uh, and then after a few months, I will know what's next for me. But first, right now, um, spend time with family and think. Think about what the next part of my life is like. And then jump in again. Right. Thank you, sir. And I, I hope you enjoy that time I with will. the family. Thank you. And, uh, okay, I think that, that wraps up the questions that we had here. So, General Berger, thank you very much for your time. Again, thank you for coming down here in person. It's great to be able to have you here for our in-person and our virtual yeah. audience. Um, to the virtual audience, thank you for joining us for this episode. As I said, this is going to be our last one before we go on a short summer break. And on a personal note, this is also my last episode as the ho uh, host of the broadcast. But the show is passing into the excellent hands of Major Paul Kimi Janikin, who is going to take up the reins here at the Krulak Center um, here in the next month or so to, to get the next season going. So. To make sure you don't miss out on the next season and to catch this one when we finally post it on our podcast and YouTube channels, make sure you're following us on email and our social media accounts for all of those announcements. And again, thank you uh, out there in the audience for your time. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. As always, we depend on support and feedback from the Team Crew Line community to constantly improve our offerings and reach a wider audience. So if you have feedback on this episode, please take a moment to fill out the survey linked in the show notes to help us do better. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel on YouTube or leave us a review on the podcast app of your choice. It truly does help us reach a wider audience. Thank you as always for your support and we'll see you on the next episode. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.